Today we want to talk about the Columbia Basin in the future, and in particular the Columbia Basin uh, through the rest of this century, specifically through 2100. Now, as we all have seen to this stage in the course, uh, the basin has changed greatly, especially since the late 1840s, 1850s, and most of that change that we've seen taking place has been driven by human choices, human actions, uh, and just basically how people relate to the landscape and res respond to various uh, policy issues. But the future of the basin, what's going to happen in the basin through the rest of this century, will also, also most likely be driven by human actions, human choices. And by future here, we're going to talk about the rest of the century through 2100. Uh, that's the most difficult area in terms of prediction is the future, and the long-term future is as difficult to predict really as the short term. Well, what exactly is likely to play out in the basin through 2100? Well, any time you talk about prediction, as the old saying goes, prediction is extremely difficult, especially if it involves the future. And that's what we're going to talk about today. What is likely to happen? What are some assumptions we can make? And what are the kinds of changes we should expect given current trajectories? Well, most of the change through 2100, I'm going to argue, is going to be driven by human actions, human choices, human policies, human responses to the environment. And I think there's going to be two, in fact, there are two major core policy drivers that will drive these changes. And how people respond to those core policy drivers will ultimately define what plays out on the landscape. The first core policy driver is the increasing human population of the Pacific Northwest. Demographers call this fill-in country. And that is, it's a country that was largely unpopulated a few centuries ago, and it's filling in by people coming here from elsewhere. So while by worldwide standards, the population density in the Pacific Northwest is relatively low, it will fill in through the rest of this century. Well, how much is going to change in terms of the fill-in? Let's look at the population of the region through 2100. And for this exercise, we recognize that the Columbia Basin covers a multitude of states, Montana, even a little bit of Nevada, Utah, Wyoming, and so forth. But we're going to focus on three states, one province, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and the province of British Columbia. Let's go back with those three states and one province and look at the population in 1850. There hadn't been many people migrate to the area from eastern North America, and the aboriginal population, the native Indian population, had died out largely due to diseases many centuries before, many decades before. And so by 1850, the area was largely uninhabited. There were probably in total about 100,000 people in the three states and one province. By 1900, the population had increased so until it reached about a million people continued to increase pretty vigorously through the 1900s, and by 1950 it had reached about 4 million people. It continued to grow through the second half of that century, and by 2000 the three states and one province had a population of about 14 million people. So the question we need to look, about, look at in predicting what's going to happen this century is, what's the population trajectory, what's likely to play out? If we take the population growth rate in the region since the end of World War II, 1945, and extrapolate it out through 2100, now that growth rate took place over some pretty tough economic, social times, various types of stressors, so it's a long-term growth rate, extrapolate it out to 2100, the population in the region will be not 14 million people, but over a hundred million people. Now you can make whatever assumptions you want about the population growth rate, but the population 2100 will be a big number. It could be above a hundred million, could be as low as 30 or 40 million if, if immigration, immigration rates really drop, but it's going to be a big number. I think for purposes of prediction, you could assume a quadrupling or quintupling of the human population by the end of this century, which would be a population of about 60 or 70 million people in the region. So I think that's the planning number that we should use as we forecast the future. Well, let's look at the landscape. When we say 60 million and 70 million people, that's a pretty abstract uh, concept. What about the landscape? 
Let's look at the, true, the two major urban areas that will be on the ground in 2100. The first will be a city which I'll call Port Jean. And Port Jean will be formed by the growing together through the rest of this century of the currently standalone cities of Eugene, Oregon, Corvallis, Albany, Salem, Portland, Vancouver, Washington, and Port Jean in 2100 will be a metropolis of about six million people. It'll essentially fill in much of the Willamette Valley. But Port Jean will be dwarfed by the metropolis to the north, the metropolis of Sivan. Sivan will be formed by the growing together of the currently independent standalone cities of Olympia, Tacoma, Seattle, Bellingham, Vancouver, BC, extending out the Fraser Valley to Hope and across the southern part of Vancouver Island. And Sivan in 2100 will be a city of approximately 30 million people, roughly the size of present day Mexico City or Tokyo. And of course, there will be population centers elsewhere in the basin. Uh, these will just be the two largest ones. And I recognize that Sivan is not within the basin, but it's close enough that its activities will very much affect the Columbia Basin. Well, how will the demands, the demands of these population centers and other people in the Northwest, these 65, 70 million people, how will their demands affect the basin? Let's look at the generic median family in North America, Canada, and U.S. This is a family that was statistically created to have the median uh, family uh, assets. And as you can see here, that somehow they can, somebody convinced these folks to move all their stuff out in the street for this photograph, and conceivably somebody else will take it back in. The family is uh, you know, 4.3 people or something like this, the average size family. There's uh, 1.2 dogs and 0.7 cats. But look in the back, they have a couple of cars, a couple of automobiles, they have an ATV, lots of appliances, lots of goods. And imagine the wealth that was required, the ecosystem services that were required to support and develop this level of assets. So the average standard of living is not likely to go down, at least not willingly go down, and this standard of living will require a lot, continue to require a lot of goods and services from the basin these days we call ecosystem services. Well, you can imagine what this increasing population will do to the demand for goods and services. For example, uh, we here we have a wheat field in eastern Washington. You can imagine the increasing demand on, the, on food sources from within the basin and elsewhere. Energy sources from all, supply, all areas will be uh, in, in very, very competitive uh, through the rest of this century. And of course, recreation of all types. Here we have a ski resort. You can imagine demands for additional ski resorts with a population that's four or five times larger. And of course, water. Water is essentially a fixed supply commodity and competition is likely to get increasingly more severe through the century. Well, let's look at water in a little bit more detail and figure out how people are likely to respond, respond to increasing competition for a scarce commodity. The aggregate supply of water in the basin is essentially fixed. I mean, there are a few things you can do. You can spread it out over the years through dams and impoundments and so forth. Uh, possibly desalination or other technological developments will somewhat increase the supply, but largely it's a fixed supply. Now you can speculate on what the conflicts, how severe the conflicts are going to be through this century. If we look at the current conflicts, look at the demand for even such recreational purposes as golf courses or lawns or home uh, landscaping. Or in the lower left, we have a water supply for a city, even areas that have relatively lots of water like the Willamette Valley and the coastal cities of Oregon. Uh, these areas have severe competition for high quality drinking water. And in the upper right, we have an example of an endanger, a habitat that's endangered, and there's lots of threatened and endangered species that are dependent on a dwindling supply of high quality water. And of course, irrigated agriculture in the lower right. Irrigated agriculture almost is throughout the basin, even the Willamette Valley, which has lots of, uh, relatively lots of water, requires irrigation late in the summer. So this competition for water is currently extremely competitive and it will get more so in the future.
Let's go back to that average family, that median family <coughs> of a century ago, about 2100, a century ago. And in 2100, that family will not be four people. It will be 16 to 20 people. So imagine these folks, after they finish this photo shoot, and they go out and say, let's go out and get some food because these guys will take this stuff back in the room, back in the house. And so they go to your favorite fast food restaurant. And what do people order at every fast food restaurant? They order hamburger fries and a drink and so forth. Imagine that fry order. Where does it come from? Well, obviously it comes from potatoes. Potatoes are grown in the Pacific Northwest. And here we have examples of farms from each of the three states and one province. And they all use irrigated agriculture to grow potatoes, at least on a commercial scale. Imagine the demand for potatoes in 2100 with a family of not of four, but 16 to 20 individuals. The demand for potatoes, wheat, corn, all other foodstuffs, all other irrigated agricultural products will substantially go up. Let's look at another demand that this population growth is likely to force people to make. Let's go back to the year 2001 in California. In 2001 was an extremely dry year and we had brownouts and blackouts happening in California in the summer. So in the summer of 2001, California was in a bad way. Power was extremely difficult to buy in the open market. Prices were through the ceiling. There really wasn't any place to get substantial amounts of power except for the hydro system on the Columbia River. It could produce power in large volumes and very quickly, and peaking power is a very strong aspect to hydropower. But the problem was there was power available, but the problem with that power was the water was being saved to help salmon migrate at key times of the year to try to bring back the salmon, wild salmon populations. So the choices that society faced were clear. You sell power to California to help a very bad problem down there. After all, it was summer, air conditioning was essential to lots of California. And the alternative is you run the powers, the, the, the dams to generate power, but you use up the water that you're saving to help salmon migrate. What was the choice? Not a pleasant set of choices, but reality. Well, the choice was made, the decision was made to run the hydro system 24 seven for three weeks to sell power to California. And everybody lamented that it was a bad situation and the salmon were gonna suffer greatly, but the choice was made and there really wasn't serious opposition to that choice. These are the kinds of choices that will confront the basin through this century as the competition for scarce water gets greater and greater. And one of the key simple lessons that's often overlooked when you deal with issues like salmon, for example, is, and, and other important uses of, of scarce water, there are no substitution options. Salmon need water. It's not like building materials where if wood becomes scarce, you can go to steel or plastic or aluminum. Salmon and other species need water. They need it in sufficient quantity uh, of sufficient quality at certain times of the year, and there's really no substitution. So every political compromise in, in essence is a loss for wild salmon. Well, the first take home message from the first core policy driver is that it is nearly certain that the number of humans in the Pacific Northwest will increase. It will be a big number. You can argue what the number will be, but I think safe to say it's gonna be a quadrupling at least of the human population. And coupled with their chosen lifestyles, it's very unlikely that people will willingly reduce their, their lifestyle standard of living. These will be a major policy driver throughout this century. The second core policy driver that will define the future of the Columbia Basin through this century is the changing climate of the Pacific Northwest. The past may be a useful indicator of the future when you deal with climate issues because you really don't have a great certainty in what's likely to happen climate-wise. So let's look at the past and get some indication of what we should expect or most likely expect in the future. Let's go back 5,000 years. These are worldwide averages. And the vertical green bars are what we call warming periods. And it started off with the Minoan warming period uh, quite a while ago. It looks like about uh, 1500 BC. And then the Roman warm period was just before uh, the birth of Christ. 
several centuries before. And then what we call and very well studied the medieval warming period, which was a period of roughly uh, 700, 800 to about 12 or 1300. Now it appears, if you look at this chart, because climate is warm for the last 100 years, it appears that we're likely to be going into another warming period. Of course, complicating that is what level of influence human actions have on this warming period. Well, let's look more carefully at the last 2,000 years. If we go back very just after the Roman warming period, we see a relatively cool time. The horizontal red line across the graph is the average temperature. And one of the take home messages is the temperature is almost never average. It fluctuates above or below the line. There's a tremendous amount of variation. But there appears to be some general patterns. Things warmed up about 600 and they cooled off at around 1200. And you can look at that medieval warming period across the top center of the graph. And that was a period where the Vikings and others very much expanded their ex exploration. The Vikings from Scandinavia got all the way over to North America and they, and they colonized a few areas, at least temporarily. And of course, those areas cooled by 1200 or so and those, pop, those uh, settlements were abandoned. Then we moved into a period, what is referred to as the Little Ice Age, about a 300 year period of very much colder than long term average temperatures. If you look at some of the Renaissance paintings of that, that time, roughly from 1400 to about 1800, you see individuals ice skating on frozen canals and rivers. And those canals and rivers have not frozen solid for the last 150 or even 200 years. So the Little Ice Age was very cold uh, by long-term averages. And then if we move into the more recent times, say the last century, uh, popular, the temperatures have definitely warmed up on the average, and we're likely to be, and if you look at this, we're likely to be heading into a warm period. If history, the past, is any indication of the future, it's likely to last for maybe 300 years. Let's look a little bit more carefully at that medieval warm period, and you can see on this chart in the upper left, about 1,000 the Vikings arrived in North America, and they stayed there. Uh, for a long time, but finally by 1350 things were pretty bad temperature wise, things had cooled off a lot, they really couldn't grow crops and survive very well, and so they abandoned those areas. And worldwide we moved into this little ice age, and that was a time of extremely cold time, uh, temperatures. And you can see all the way to the right of this graph, a little bit of red there, that's current times where things are starting to warm up again. But what happened in the Pacific Northwest during these various warm periods? We don't have good data, but we do have good data relative to the Vikings. The Northwest, let's reconstruct or let's look at a graph of the Western area and look at a period of time the last 1200 years. And this chart gives an indication of the index of droughts. And so below the line, the red areas are areas where you had drought conditions, and above the line were areas that you had relatively plentiful water and you had um, wet years. And you can see, as with temperature, there's a lot of variation in the numbers. But in general, the warm period did result in some droughts. And the cool period corresponding to the Little Ice Age was a relatively speaking wet time in the Pacific Northwest. So the question we need to look at is what's likely to happen in the future? And my guess is, very strong guess I think, is that it's going to warm. Now you can argue how much of that warming is due to human actions, but even if human action wasn't involved, it appears that we're likely to go into a long-term period of very warm conditions coupled with, in general, drought conditions. And imagine what this would mean for ecosystem services, goods and services from the basin. Agriculture, which is viable in certain places now, may not be viable. In other places where it's not viable, it could become viable. So agriculture will change. Not entirely clear how it'll change, but it's likely to be less water, and therefore irrigated agriculture is less profitable or less viable. In the lower left area, we have, going back to the recreational activity of ski resorts, we're going to have to have, if all things are equal, four or five times more ski resorts than we do now. But of course, snowpack is one of the areas that's very greatly affected by water supply, and so snowpacks are likely to be less, not more. Hydropower is very much affected by water conditions, drought conditions, and so it'll be difficult to run the hydro system with uh, assuming that we have current levels of water availability. So let's look a little more at that available water issue. 
And in the Columbia Basin, we have a situation that snowpack is crucial because the water basically, there really is sufficient water on a year-round basis, but the problem is it tends to run mostly out in the spring runoff and early summer runoff. So if snowpack is reduced, it will have big changes. In the summer months, especially late summer months, in the upper left, we have a farmer here looking lamentably at his poor supply of water. In the lower right, we have a uh, impoundment storing drinking water for a city in the Willamette Valley. Uh, this is likely to be a very, very scarce commodity as snowpacks are reduced. In the upper right, we have a new housing development where they're laying in a water supply. And where are you going to get these water supplies through the century as water becomes less and less available and more and more expensive? And of course, we go back to our old friend wild salmon, which are having a difficult time now. And with warmer conditions and less water, we'll have an even greater stress. So changing climate, warming, means that runs of wild salmon will be affected. How will they be affected? Well, salmon respond in lots of ways that aren't completely clear-cut. Let's look at a historical reconstruction of a wild salmon run. This happens to be in Alaska. Uh, and this is a run that was reconstructed going back 2,200 years. So on the far left of the graph, we have the population of the salmon run in this basin, which reached about a million fish around 200 BC. And then over that century or two, it declined markedly. And so by biblical times, the run was down to a few hundred thousand. Again, human intervention here was negligible or none probably. And so these are just natural changes. And through the next 2,000 years or nearly 2,000 years, the population fluctuated, but in general went up. And then it started to decline at around uh, 1,700 a little bit and then came back in the late 1800s and again reached a population level of about four million fish. And then in the far right of the graph, it dropped off a lot in the last 100 years, uh, primarily due to fishing pressure. So the take home message here is that salmon runs do respond to climate change in ways that sometimes aren't completely clear, but they'll definitely respond. And in general, intuitively, it seems reasonable that less water means less viable salmon runs. But changing climate will also affect transportation in the basin, which is another kind of a lifeblood of the economics of the area. In the upper left, we have a seagoing vessel that's parked in Portland. And seagoing vessels can get up the, the lower Columbia River, and they can reach Portland and unload and load. But that requires two things. It requires a good supply of water, and it requires almost continuous dredging. So with less water, it's going to be more difficult, not necessarily impossible, but more difficult to maintain Portland as a port that can get seagoing vessels. And in the upper right, we have a barge on its way to Lewiston, Idaho. Lewiston, Idaho is the furthest inland seaport uh, in North America. And it, barges can get all the way up the Columbia Basin through these dams and locks in the lower right. Uh, but again, this requires a sufficient amount of water to achieve this. With less water, it'll probably be more difficult to maintain these reservoirs at full pool, which is required to transport these barges. So the second take-home message, based on the second policy driver, is that the climate of the Pacific Northwest is nearly certain to continue to change. It has changed in the past, and there's every reason to think that it'll continue to change in the future. And this change will profoundly affect the way the choices that individuals and society makes. Now, even given these two core policy drivers, the future of the basin is not set in stone. These core policy drivers are the overarching drivers, but society has choices, society has alternatives, and society has things that it can do uh, if it wants to create a different trajectory. So the third take-home message, which is kind of a concluding message, is that both the two core policy drivers I talked about and society's policy choices in response to those two, two core policy drivers uh, are driving the future. But society's choices can change. Those aren't set in concrete. Society could make alternative changes or change the direction of certain types of policies and so forth. And that is entirely up to people. Let me conclude with a final take home message is Regardless of what happens in the basin, regardless of how this century plays out, it will be an interesting century to watch.